Hello everyone. Welcome back to History 1152. In this video, we will explore some of the biggest social, political, and technological changes that occurred in the United States from 1877 to roughly 1917, what many scholars call the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era. This 40-year period was a time of massive, dizzying change for the people of the United States. So far, we've talked about some of these changes and how they impacted life in the American South and the American West. In this video, we're going to explore these advancements and how they helped to inspire political and social movements in the country as a whole. In the years following the U.S. Civil War, the trend of industrialization in the northern states, New England, the Mid-Atlantic, and the eastern Midwest increased significantly. The need for inexpensive war materiel and supplies necessitated the building of factories and government contracts awarded to corporations producing military goods funneled money into the industrial economy. Many of the technological developments that we take for granted every day, like shoes with standard left and right soles and mass-produced soap, became universal during and after the Civil War. Northern industrialization increased significantly, and while the South's economy was devastated by the war, its economic systems were rebuilt along more industrial lines, as we discussed in our video about the New South. The West did not industrialize in the same way that the Eastern states did, but the West did supply the raw materials and commodities that kept the Eastern factories going. America was rapidly industrializing, and the country was rapidly urbanizing as well. Immigrants were arriving in the United States through ports of entry, like Ellis Island in New York Harbor. While some made their way to rural areas, often in the West, many more settled in the cities, especially New York City and Chicago, rapidly redefining life and culture in urban America. Technological developments in agriculture also meant that fewer farm workers were needed in rural areas to keep Americans fed. Workers who were not able to establish homesteads in the West often had no choice but to go to the urban center to find work. Inventors like Cyrus McCormick also developed more efficient plows and reapers, allowing farmers to plant and harvest more crops with less time and energy, lowering food prices, but also minimizing the need for farm labor. During this period, American workers became more organized and began to establish labor unions in order to collectively bargain for higher wages. While working conditions, collective bargaining, and striking were not new things in America by the 1870s, some of the biggest and most famous strikes occurred during this period. The 1877 Railroad Strike, the Haymarket Riot of 1886, the Pullman Strike of 1894, and the Paint Creek Strike of 1912 all occurred during this period. What made strikes so common at this time? One of the biggest reasons strikes were frequent in the late 19th and early 20th century came because of increased technological developments. Inventions like the telegraph, steam roller printing, which made newspapers and other printed goods much cheaper, allowed disgruntled workers across the country to hear about what other laborers organizing for better wages and working conditions were doing. Other technologies, like the telephone and the motion picture camera, were also invented during this period, which also helped to hasten the speed that ideas could travel. Workers in New York City could read about new developments with a strike going on in Chicago each day as it happened, and even speak with them. Communication developments also helped middle and upper class individuals, who often knew very little about the plight of working class people, gain a better idea of what life and work was like for the poor and laboring classes. American workers could also read about labor and workers' movements and insurrections in other parts of the world, especially the Paris Commune of 1871 which came as a result of food shortages and economic disruption in the wake of the Franco-Prussian War. Just as important as the advances to communication were, changes that occurred in the workplace in the late 19th and early 20th century were impactful.
inspiring workers to call for better conditions. During the economic recessions that occurred in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, many big companies would lower the wages they paid their workers in order to keep their profits up. This was the primary factor that motivated the railroad strike of 1877. The 1877 railroad strike happened because the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad cut its employees' wages for the third time that year, leading workers in Martinsburg, West Virginia to go on strike in July. They refused to work and blocked the passage of trains. The B&O Railroad tried to suppress the strike by hiring militias of strikebreakers to disperse the strikers. The militias, with the assistance of state and federal troops, broke up the strikes by August. The strikes received national attention and outcry, with Americas condemning the acts of the strikers, but also the harsh response of the troops and railroad militias. Ultimately, the B&O Railroad gave in to some of the strikers' demands in order to prevent future strikes and the negative attention they brought to their company. In 1886, workers demonstrated in May at Haymarket Square in Chicago. The workers were striking primarily for the eight-hour workday, among other things. Tensions flared after the Chicago police killed one of the protesters on May 3rd and injured several others. The police arrived at the scene of the protest on May 4th, which had been mostly peaceful that day. As police advanced on the strikers to disperse them, someone threw a bomb in their path. The bomb exploded and killed seven officers and wounded 60 more. Eight men, who had been part of an anarchist group that was aligned with the protesters, were arrested. Seven of them were sentenced to death. Two of the convicted men had their sentences commuted to life imprisonment, and one committed suicide in prison. The Haymarket Affair of 1886 was a significant event and a watershed moment in la American labor history. Labor organizations, along with anarchist, socialist, and communist groups, had made common cause in advocating for workers' interests, but the bombing in Chicago and the criminal case that followed divided the American public, who became concerned that labor movements were being influenced by foreign revolutionary organizations, even as many labor groups, like the Knights of Labor, tried to distance themselves from the anarchists. The fact that most of the conspirators in the bombing were German immigrants only made the situation more volatile, increasing anti-immigrant sentiment, especially against immigrants from Germany, although Germans would not be the only immigrants that would see increased difficulty in trying to migrate to the U.S. during the Gilded Age. Demographics of the immigrants that came to the U.S. in the late 19th and early 20th century differ from the backgrounds of the immigrant groups who came to the country in previous years. Whereas in the past, most immigrants came from northwestern Europe, many more immigrants were coming from southern and eastern Europe and Asia, concerning many Americans who believed that these immigrants were too different to assimilate into American society. Some even thought that these new immigrants were racially inferior to white Americans of Northwestern European heritage. Certain immigrant groups, like the Chinese, were almost completely banned from entering the United States in 1882. This Chinese Exclusion Act was renewed in 1892 and 1902, and not repealed until 1943. In addition to increasing anti-immigration sentiment, the Haymarket Affair also promoted a Red Scare, as Americans began to develop more antipathy to socialist and communist groups after seeing the connection between the bombers and these movements. The link between labor groups and socialists has persisted to this day, although the relationship has taken different forms over time. The Pullman strike of 1894 was also an important strike during the Gilded Age. Industrial workers who built rail cars for the Pullman Company began to protest for higher wages and better working and living conditions, since they lived in a housing community just south of Chicago, owned by the Pullman Company. The workers were angry about layoffs and pay cuts, but they were also feeling that they were being oppressed in the Pullman town, 
because the Pullman Company charged high rent and utilities for the houses, and the workers were not able to purchase the homes in which they lived. The protest was a wildcat strike, as the workers did not have the backing of established labor unions. Instead, the factory workers joined the brand new American Railway Union, ARU, founded in 1893 by labor organizer and socialist Eugene B. Debs. Debs, the ARU, and the workers called for the boycott of Pullman and began to strike and disrupt the passage of trains. Other labor unions, including the American Federation of Labor, AFL, and the Railroad Brotherhoods refused to join the strike and actually condemned the strikers. On the rails employees of Pullman, conductors and porters, many of whom were black, did not join the strike. The federal government got involved, breaking up the strike with the Illinois National Guard after the strikers disrupted the passage of mail trains. Ultimately, Eugene V. Debs, in spite of his defense by the famous lawyer Clarence Darrow, on trial for his involvement in the strike, was convicted of violating a court order and sentenced to prison. The, AR the ARU was dissolved, and 30 workers lay dead at the end of the failed strike. The Pullman strike of 1894, like the Haymarket Affair of 1886, further cemented the link between labor interests and socialism leading middle-class Americans to become more suspicious of workers' movements. At the same time, however, the Pullman strike also showed that workers' strikes would be far less su successful without mass organization of different groups of laboring people, demonstrating the need for established union support. While Americans tended to be divided over the efficacy and legitimacy of unions and labor movements, they were much more unified over their concern of the broad social changes that were occurring in the country. Middle class Americans may have mistrusted organized labor with its ties to foreign and domestic revolutionary groups, but they were also mistrustful of the new upper class that had come to be in the years following the Civil War, with their rapid wealth gains and their massive corporations that they ran. Men like John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie, heads of Standard Oil and U.S. Steel, respectively, were also not to be trusted. Who were these men, and why did the same Americans who opposed organized labor also oppose them? Let's start with Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie was born in Scotland in 1835. Growing up, Carnegie's family struggled financially, so they migrated to the United States in 1848, settling in western Pennsylvania. Carnegie worked in the rapidly expanding railroad business throughout the 1850s and eventually accumulated enough capital to start his own railroad company. Carnegie did not fight in the Civil War, but he did help the Union war effort by helping to repair lines into Washington, D.C. that had been destroyed by the Confederates. He also engaged in other projects related to railroad construction, helping the Union to further integrate its military and industry, transforming the Union into the Yankee Leviathan, while also making Carnegie very wealthy, giving him the chance to gain enough capital to break into the steel industry. Steel was, and still is, an essential raw material for the construction of railroads. By buying steel mills while also building railroads, Carnegie was pioneering what we today call vertical integration, wherein business owners buy their businesses that produce goods that they need to sell Carnegie continued to buy steel companies, forming a business conglomerate that would become U.S. Steel, which held a near monopoly on American steel production. Investors like J.P. Morgan argued that U.S. Steel and monopolies like it would allow business leaders to sell better goods to consumers at a lower price, while also paying workers higher wages, since there would be no competition, duplication, or waste within a single industry. Morgan eventually bought Carnegie's conglomerate for over $300 million. U.S. Steel would go on to be the first corporation valued at over $1 billion. After the sale of U.S. Steel in 1901, Carnegie basically retired from industry and took up work as a ph philanthropist and political activist. Carnegie supported arts and education campaigns, 
helping to establish Carnegie Hall and the Carnegie Mellon University. Carnegie was also a prolific writer in his later years and published numerous articles, including The Gospel of Wealth, in which he argued that rich men like himself were good for society because they would take care of those less fortunate than themselves. Many Americans liked Carnegie for his philanthropy, but others felt that he did not do enough to help the poor, considering he was one of the wealthiest people in the world, and of all time, with an estimated net worth of $310 billion in today's money. It is estimated that he spent over $300 million in, on his philanthropic work during his lifetime. Contemporary political cartoons showed Carnegie as a giant, sprinkling coins across the countryside, even as he held a bag of money that was bigger than he was. He was generous, but not generous enough. The cartoons also used nativist rhetoric as well, depicting Carnegie as wearing a kilt, a piece of ethnic Scottish garb, highlighting that he was an immigrant. While some people distrusted Carnegie for his wealth and because he was an immigrant, even more people mistrusted John D. Rockefeller. Who was John D. Rockefeller? Well, John D. Rockefeller was born in Richland, upstate New York, in 1839. He was born into a large but poor family of 16 children. John's father, William, or Devil Bill as he was known, struggled to keep a regular job, and often turned to con artistry to pay the bills. Bill was also known for having loose morals, standing in stark contrast to John's mother, Eliza, who was a devout Christian. Bill eventually left the family, marrying a woman and starting a new life for himself in Canada, leaving Elizabeth and, jo and young John to work for the rest of the family. John worked a variety of odd jobs to support the family, but eventually became a bookkeeper in 1855 after moving to Cleveland, Ohio. While working as a bookkeeper, Rockefeller practiced negotiation in order to find the lowest transportation costs for the company he worked for, Hewitt and Tuttle. Rockefeller had a keen eye for logistics and finding the cheapest and most efficient ways to transport goods. Rockefeller was also in charge of collecting debts owed to the company. By 1859, Rockefeller started his own shipping company with his friend Maurice Clark. Rockefeller also began refining oil about this time, turning it into kerosene, which was used for lighting. Rockefeller's company dumped the oil byproducts, including gasoline, into the Cuyahoga River, causing it to catch on fire in 1868. It is estimated that the Cuyahoga has caught fire 13 times since then although efforts to clean up the river in recent years have prevented this destruction. During the Civil War, Rockefeller refused to join the Union Army, instead hiring substitutes to take his place. Despite this, Rockefeller was an abolitionist who supported the end of slavery, voting for Abraham Lincoln in 1864. Rockefeller was also a religious man as well, adopting his mother's Christian faith. Rockefeller's religious convictions which encouraged hard work and frugality, inspired his business practices. But he also used his religious beliefs to justify his wealth. He believed that he had been given his riches by God and thus should make no apologies for it. The climate of the Civil War, with the need for products like kerosene, gave Rockefeller the opportunity to amass great wealth and open his own refineries. Rockefeller eventually found ways to increase profits by selling the byproducts of the oil he refined. He also used techniques of vertical integration, buying the transportation companies that moved his goods, and the construction developers who built his facilities. Rockefeller also bought up other oil companies and used his influence to control the logistics industries, using them like a cartel, to essentially run other oil refiners out of business by refusing to transport the products of his competitors. Unable to do business, Rockefeller bought up the competing oil companies, transforming his corporation, Standard Oil, into a monopoly through the practices of horizontal integration, buying up all of one kind of industry. It is estimated that at its peak, Standard Oil controlled about 90% of American oil production 
Many Americans were alarmed at the control Standard Oil had over the entire oil industry, which was becoming more essential with the popularization of new technologies, like the internal combustion engine. People also thought that Rockefeller had built his business empire through unethical means, using cartelization to run his competitors out of business. Rockefeller continued to expand Standard Oil's control of other industries, including steel, leading Rockefeller's interests to collide with those of Andrew Carnegie and J.P. Morgan, whom we talked about earlier. Investigative journalists, known as muckrakers, began looking into how Rockefeller had built his Standard Oil Trust. Ida Tarbell, in her scathing work, The History of the Standard Oil Company, criticized Rockefeller's cartelizing business practices. Public pressure against Rockefeller Standard Oil and similar monopolies led President Theodore Roosevelt to make trust busting a major tenet of his political agenda, inspiring the U.S. government to go after monopolies more aggressively. Ultimately, Standard Oil was broken up by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1911, but Rockefeller, who was mostly retired at this point, remained a very wealthy man and even profited from the breakup and maintained stock in all of the companies that were created during the separation. Ultimately, Rockefeller's net worth in today's money would be about $340 billion, making him the wealthiest American of all time when taking inflation and GDP into account. Like Carnegie, Rockefeller was a philanthropist and spent up to half of his personal fortune on charity work, including the founding of the John D. Rockefeller Foundation. Rockefeller's approach to philanthropy, however, was a little different to Carnegie's. While both men gave a lot of money to help the poor, Rockefeller was less inclined to support institutions that did not align with his personal views, and he did not like to support organizations, groups, or people that he thought were unwilling or even unable to help themselves. Rockefeller's attitude towards philanthropy bore elements of social Darwinism, a contemporary idea that applied Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection to people and institutions. Social Darwinism taught that only those who would help themselves deserve charity. People who could not help themselves must not be assisted, otherwise they would never adapt the ability to help themselves. Social Darwinism suggested that poverty could be eliminated because the self-sufficient poor would receive assistance while the dependent poor will either learn how to become independent or die out. Many elements of social Darwinism are still popular today. While industrial magnates like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller gave millions of dollars, billions in the modern equivalent to philanthropic work, millions of Americans mistrusted these extremely wealthy business tycoons, calling them robber barons, for their unscrupulous business tactics and cartelization of industries. While Carnegie and Rockefeller were both self-made men, building their wealth out of poverty, their creation of large corporations and their attitude towards economic competition would make it more difficult for entrepreneurs to establish their own businesses, essentially making the rise of future Rockefellers and future Carnegies more difficult, at least in the industries they dominated, namely oil and steel. Carnegie's creation and Rockefeller's creation of modern corporations and the antitrust laws they helped to inspire have stayed with us to the present day as Americans from a variety of backgrounds worry about the growth of new industries, especially media corporations and Silicon Valley tech firms and what the media tech landscape with minimal competition will mean for American society and culture. Americans in the late 19th and early 20th century were also concerned about the massive wealth that accrued for the so-called robber barons even though they gave much of their money to charity. Concern over wealth inequality is just as much of a concern now as it was during the Gilded Age. Now, when studying the late 19th and early 20th century United States, it is easy to become frustrated, even discouraged with how events played out. Industrial workers tried to organize for change, but had their movements co-opted, suppressed, and dismissed by the nation as a whole. The populist movement, which we talked about in our video on the New South, tried to galvanize black and white agricultural workers, but ultimately failed, leaving the South under control of white supremacist Southern Democrats. At the same time, 
the robber barons built massive business empires, and while they offered products at lower prices, their creation of massive corporations and trusts made upward mobility more difficult, even as they engaged in philanthropic work. Nonetheless, there were some Americans that advocated for and implemented many reforms that were successful. Who were these reformers? Rather than being members of the elite, this new group of reformers, called progressives, largely came from the middle class. In the past, American reformers had come largely from the elite. Most of the American founding fathers, for example, came from wealthy backgrounds, or at least had become part of the upper class by the time they were, were concerned with reform and independence from Great Britain. The progressives on the whole were well-educated, disciplined, and striving for change as middle-class people. The progressives were also a diverse group of people, men and women coming together from different parts of the progressive coalition. Progressives like Edith and Grace Abbott, Jane Addams, William Jennings Bryan, Eugene V. Debs, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., Robert LaFollet, Sr., Theodore Roosevelt, Al Smith, and Woodrow Wilson are a testament to the diversity of background of progressives. Some progressives were religious and others were secular. The progressives were also not partisan. They were Democrats, Republicans, and activists who did not support the two mainstream parties. Republican President Theodore Roosevelt and Democratic President Woodrow Wilson both made progressive policies an important part of their political agendas. The progressives also came from a variety of backgrounds, although most were professionals, who had received education and training that prepared them for their careers. They were doctors, lawyers, teachers, journalists, social workers, politicians, and political activists. What kind of policies did the progressives advocate? The progressives recognized that America and the world was changing rapidly. And the pace of change was heightening with increased immigration and technological developments. The progressives wanted to improve society using their professional expertise and the power of the U.S. government, which they believed could be a force for good if guided by principled, educated people. The progressives saw the poverty of working people, many of whom were immigrants or first-generation Americans, and sought to help them. The progressives also mistrusted the elite, the robber barons believing that they had created many of the problems that the poor were facing and that they were more concerned with helping themselves over helping the poor. They also thought that the American upper class was immoral and undisciplined since their wealth was dependent on the labor of the working class. To solve the problems in American society, the progressives proposed a variety of solutions. They called for increased government regulation of business to ensure that consumer goods were safe and not tainted, to protect both working and middle class people. The progressives also tried to restrain the growth of big business through the enforcement of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which had been used to break up Standard Oil. Progressives who were religious advocated a policy called the social gospel. In many ways, the social gospel was the opposite of social Darwinism. The social gospel mandated that the rich and the educated had a responsibility to take care of the poor to make a kinder, gentler world. Rather than only assisting some of the poor, all of the poor were to be helped according to social gospel proponents. The social gospel drew heavily on Christian beliefs, especially the Lord's Prayer, which mandates that the will of God must be done on earth as it is in heaven. Social gospel advocates took this mandate one step further, believing they ought to make heaven on earth by using Christian principles like brotherly love and cutting-edge scientific knowledge to fix social problems like poverty, racial inequality, women's rights, and the assimilation of immigrants into American society as a whole. Social gospel proponents also brought Christian ideas of morality into their advocacy for the poor especially when it came to the prohibition of alcohol, which they believed were responsible for many of society's ills. Social gospel advocates also brought Christian eschatology into their activism, 
They tended to be post-millennialists, believing that the world's salvation depended on their actions and that Jesus Christ could not return to bring an end to the earth until the world had been perfected through human reform. Some of the most important social gospel campaigners within the progressive movement as a whole were Richard Ely, Washington Gladden, Walter Rausenbush, and Josiah Strong. The social gospel progressives often disagreed on policies and their implementation, but they could agree on the efficacy of social activism informed by Christian beliefs. The progressive movement was large, dynamic, and diverse, and included a variety of people who had different beliefs about the nature of social problems. But the progressives were also successful because, while they were diverse in background and expertise, many were unified in their belief that American society ought to be reformed. And that they, along with the help of the government, ought to be the ones to help bring these changes about. The progressives fought to assimilate and integrate immigrants, prohibit alcohol, pass regulatory laws like the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, advance workers' rights, especially those surrounding the eight-hour workday, extend rights to women and African Americans, and establish a social welfare and public health programs to improve the lives of the poor. While many people today criticize the progressives for trying to force people, especially immigrants, to conform to the Anglo-American dominant culture and for pushing their religious beliefs on people, especially when it came to alcohol prohibition, there is no doubt that the progressives changed the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century, creating the country we know and live in today. The progressives created the progressive era, which extended from the late 1890s to the First World War. During this period, they controlled politics and fundamentally changed America, bringing an end to the Gilded Age. There were some incredible technological changes that occurred during the late 1800s and early 1900s. Thomas Edison, perhaps the greatest American inventor, who took out over 1,000 patents, created the first practical incandescent light bulb, the phonograph, and the motion picture camera. He also made some important discoveries in the creation and distribution of electricity. Alexander Graham Bell, an immigrant from Scotland like Andrew Carnegie, developed the first practical electric telephone and started the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, AT&T, in 1885. Edison and Bell's discoveries fundamentally changed how Americans could take in information for the first time, Americans had practical ways to hear the human voice over distance, via the telephone, and over time, via the phonograph. They could also watch real action in motion as well. There were also some huge discoveries in transportation technology as well. Railroads proliferated across the country, integrating urban and rural, east and west, as we discussed in our dis lecture on the West. The internal combustion engine allowed for the construction of the first practical automobiles, which, fueled by gasoline from companies like Standard Oil, annihilated time and space. The internal combustion engine was also used for powered flight. Orville and Wilbur Wright of Dayton, Ohio, flew the first motorized aircraft in 1903 at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Bicycles, which were invented in Europe, became popular in the United States and were an important mode of conveyance and leisure. Indeed, the middle class Americans began to develop more of a leisure culture as technological developments in this period allowed for more free time, which could be used for political activism as the progressives did, but also could be used for sports, hobbies, and other relaxation activities. For the poor and working class, leisure activities were often out of reach because they had very little free time or disposable income, and many middle-class reformers thought that the poor should pursue education or job training rather than relaxation during their off hours. Ultimately, though, working-class people faced many challenges in the 1870s to the 1910s, but their everyday experiences did improve during this period as a result of technological and political advancements. It was a period of both negatives as well as positives.